Love incarnate, love divine Star and angels gave the sign Bow to babe on bended knee The Savior of humanity Unto us a child is born He shall reign
City? Merry Christmas! I know it's just a few hours early, but we do celebrate a very Merry Christmas amongst God's people today, and we're reminded, especially on this day, of God's love. That's our theme for our message today, and going into the night service. I invite you to come back this evening at 6.30. We've got a beautiful candlelight service with communion to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But we're here to worship this morning. We're here to bask in God's love for His people. We're here to rejoice in the blessings that He's poured out upon you, this church, and all God's people. So, let us worship. Amen. Let's stand. Joy to the world. Depart in peace and take with you the certain knowledge that God is always coming into the world. Seek God not in a long ago stable or ancient manger, but in the people we meet and the depths of our own hearts. May the blessing of Christmas make you a blessing to others. Go forth in hope, peace, joy, and love.
Amen. This next song is a special request. That's right. I take requests. So you can remember that in 2024 that Darren takes requests. All right, let's stand together and sing Beautiful Star of Bethlehem. <laughs>
Well, good morning, everyone. How are you all doing today? Good. Are you ready for opening presents under the tree? Yes? You're waking up at 5, just like a normal school day. Right? Oh, oh. What? They think they're waking up at They can wake up at 5 and wait around until you get up, right? All right. Well, hey, um... Do you know, have you ever like looked at license plates or do you know that every state has its own motto? You know that? Like, what, what state mottos do you know? Tennessee is what? The volunteer state. That's an easy one. We live here, right? The garden state. What's that? New Jersey, right? What else? The bluegrass state, that's Kentucky. Huh? First, North Carolina. Huh? The peach state, I think, first in heaven. What? Oma, West Virginia. <laughs> Virginia's for, well, anyway, there's all kinds of, before we get too far down that road, Shirley. Um, every state has a motto, and like I grew up in Illinois, so it was Land of Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln. And I lived in Missouri for a long time, and I really like their motto. You know what the Missouri state motto is? Show me. When I think about um, God's love, I sometimes think of that motto, show me. Because how do you know if somebody loves you? They might say it, but they really show how much they love you, right? Can you think of ways that God shows you how much he loves you? I'll get you off the hook here in a second. He gave us his only son, that's right. That's what we celebrate at Christmas and really throughout our whole lives, right? That God gave us his son that we don't have to be alone in the world, that we don't have to carry the burden of our mistakes, failures. We can lean on Jesus. That's the best way I think God is showing us that he loves us. But do you know that by simply being here today, being who you are, knowing that God created you is another way that he shows that he loves us. There is no one else in the world like Brianna. There is no one else in the world like Matt. There's no one else in the world like Pastor Tom. That's for sure and some laughter. Good. So he told us he he created us. So he gave us his son he created us. Then he gave us the Bible, his word that contains all kinds of promises and blessings. It tells us how to live and shows us God's ways. And really, I've heard the Bible described as a love story. It's all about God's love for all creation and you and I. And then there's something that's kind of tricky, maybe. The Bible says that God is jealous for you. You know what that means? Have you ever been jealous? No? Yes? 
Maddie. Oh, well, you can tell me later. You're turning red. So to be jealous means that you want that person's attention, right? You want that person's love back. You want that person uh, to appreciate who you are. And God is jealous for us. In other words, He wants to know us. He wants us to be the number one focus of life. And the last way that we know that God loves us is that God's heart beats to be in relationship with you. He desires nothing more than to know you and for you to know Him. and To walk with Him each and every day. To know His Word and have it written on your hearts. And just to bless you richly with the life that He created you to live. He gives us meaning and purpose when we have a relationship. So I hope you'll remember that God shows us all kinds of different ways that He loves us. But as Addie said, the best way is Jesus. Remember that? All right. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for the gift of Jesus. During this time of year, we celebrate the birth of Your Son, our Savior. Help us to hold on to that, that You came down from heaven to live among us, to bear our burdens, to set us free. You did that through the gift of Jesus. Help us to know You and to love You deeper each day and bless these little ones as they grow in their faith and love for You. All in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good deal. You can go back to your seat. Please bow your heads for the prayer of elimination, please. Lord, thank you for sending your Son to be the light that pierces the darkness that covers the world. As we conclude a year that has felt darker, harder, and heavier for our world, would you give us the strength to cling to you through it all? Would you fill our hearts and homes with joy and love this Christmas? Amen. We have two readings today. The first one is from Galatians chapter 4, 4 through 5. When the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Second reading is Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 14. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the time has reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. 
And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked with him as the seal that promised the Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are in God's possession, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed for those glorious words that remind us of God's promises today throughout our lives. You know, it's almost here, isn't it? It's almost that time when Christmas Day arrives and we celebrate the birth of Jesus and we gather with family and friends and we open presents under the tree and eat way too much and we've already spent way too much money. But I had to be reminded about the true meaning of Christmas the other day. See, I had a plan going into this last week leading up to Christmas. I knew that Friday was payday, right? Some people at least got paid on Friday. So Friday, I don't know about yesterday, but Friday would be one heck of a shopping day. So I had it planned in my little brain, that I would do all my last-minute shopping things, food, presents, whatever I needed, on Thursday. So that's what I did. I tried to take care of everything on Thursday. You know what happens. You know what they say, right? The best laid plans, they usually go... Right? They usually go bad. So Friday, I had to go out. Oh, my Lord. Oh. I tried to put on the happiest face I could because otherwise, man, I would have lost it at least twice. I mean, the traffic that day. It looked like everybody in Kingsport was on the road. I mean, I just wish Sunday morning would look that like that. Don't you? Everybody rush into church? Then, you know, you're, I'm in the store, and I went to Hobby Lobby, and I went to the grocery store, and in both places, you know, it's like bumper carts. You know, you're turning the corner, <laughs> crash into a cart, or somebody comes around and blindsides you. Bam, T-bone, call 911. We need a police report. Then the lines at the checkout alone. And if you're anything like me, you have a knack for picking what you think is the shortest line, but it's always the longest line, right? It's like you get, you're just about to get there. Uh, we need a price check on coloring books. Yeah, come on, man. So it was testing my patience. I was joking around with the cashiers. I was like, man, this is a busy day. Bless you for all you do, because today God is testing my patience. And, you know, it's easy to get wrapped up into those types of situations, right? The distractions and uh, the parties and everything. We say that every year, and we try to keep our focus on Jesus. If we do keep our focus on Jesus, if we can take that deep breath and instead of react, reflect a little bit on why we're celebrating in the first place and what the true meaning is, Christmas is truly a blessed time of year, isn't it? Maybe you get to see family from out of town that's moved away like, well, like Luke here. He's come all the way from San Diego back from from the service to spend time with the family. Maybe you've got family and friends that are going to join your table that you haven't seen in a while. There's all that food. Man, I'm on a sugar low today. I had, we gathered last night for 35 of us. And, whew, talk about the carbs. But you gather together and there's a lot of reason to celebrate, but unfortunately, you look around and so many people are caught up in the things I described at first, right? The frustrations, the debt, the weight gain, whatever it is. The disappointments of Christmas. Oh, I didn't get that thing I really, really wanted. 
or so-and-so can't be here this Christmas. You know, if we keep our focus, like I talked about last week with joy, if we keep our focus in the right area, it changes our whole attitude. If we keep our focus on Jesus, we experience God's love each and every year in our hearts in a new way. We experience God's love that guides us and leads us and shapes who we are. You know, you got to know for certain that God loves you, right? And the birth, the birth of the baby Jesus is certainly one way that we know and we can rejoice as believers that we have Jesus in our lives. We're not alone in this world. And that Jesus, let me just hit this, Jesus is the only reason for the season. Not just a reason, the only reason for the season. It's our job to tell people that in whatever gentle, grace-filled, loving way we can. And Paul tells us in the Scripture why we're so blessed and why we can rejoice and why we know God loves us like the show me state example in the kids sermon, right? Paul says we're chosen people. Paul says God's will will be revealed through Jesus Christ in your life and for the world. Because of Jesus, we're redeemed. Because of Jesus, we're forgiven. Because of Jesus, you have been adopted into God's family. Because of Jesus, you are sons and daughters of the living, loving, longing God of the universe. Because of Jesus, you are heirs to the kingdom of God. That's some pretty powerful stuff if you ask me when God says, you are my child. That's where your identity comes from. That's where your purpose comes from. That's where the meaning of life comes from. And it all is because of Jesus. You know, let me just add some additional evidence to that in, in our theme for today and our message. At the very heart of Christmas is God's love. God's love for you, God's love for me, and God's love for the world. And it, it's God's love is that it's a different love than we're used to experiencing. It's a perfect love. It's an unconditional love. And most importantly, it's a sacrificial kind of love. You know, one of the most known verses of the Bible is John 3.16, right? John 3.16 says what? And then he says in 17 these words, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. You know, there's a couple of words there in that verse that, that really pop out to at least me. The first is the theme of the day, God's love. He loved the world so much. And the second word is that He gave. One of the characteristics of God besides love is giving. And not just giving a little bit or just enough, but abundantly giving. Abundantly giving. God is a generous God who pours out not just a little bit, not just enough to get us through, but more than enough. God gave. That is the nature and He gave out of love for us. You know, when I think about that verse in general, and, and maybe you do too, you see it at, you know, the football game, right, in the stands, John 3.16, some of those football players, I think Tim Tebow used to do this, he'd have John 3.16 on his uh, eye stuff. 
I black, is that what it's called? And so, you know, we're all familiar with this verse, and you all did great just memorizing that verse. But sometimes we think of that only as like a summation of the gospel or a way to salvation. If you know that God loved you and he gave his son, you're going to have eternal life. That's how you get saved. You accept Jesus in your heart. But it's so much more than that because, again, it shows God's giving, generous, abundant nature. He doesn't live like we do with that theology of scarcity. Oh, it'll be enough. It'll be good enough. But he gives his very best. And he does it out of love. So, as a new Christian, or maybe even today, you kind of struggle, though, with how does that verse touch me personally in my heart? I know for me as a new Christian, I struggle with that. I I remember the time in which I accepted Christ as my Savior, and um, I was 33 years old. Um, I'd been in the army, just imagine. I'd done all the wrong things in college, just imagine. Uh, I've got all kinds of mark. well, I've got a couple marks on my body that testified to my, I call them signs of grace, Right? My pierced ear. I wanted to be like everybody else. And that was, you know, everybody's getting their ear pierced. So when I look at that little scar in there, I think about God's grace. I think about this tattoo I got. And I think about God's grace. Because everybody was doing it in the army. The first day I got to get off base, guess what happened? Got a tattoo. But everything changed. In, I think it was June, well, yeah, it was the end of June in 1995. I was sitting in a counselor's office. I was in an outpatient uh, program for substance abuse, alcohol. And luckily, God just, I mean, he weaved everything together just perfectly. And he set me up with this guy. His name was Mark. And at the time, you know, I was struggling. I, I was out of the army. I was addicted, you know, helpless alcoholic. I had a family to take care of. I didn't have a job. Everything was going the wrong way. And luckily, God got my attention. I got in this program, and I got connected with Mark. And for the first time in my life, I'd known about Jesus for the first 33 years. I'd heard the stories. We read the, the scriptures about the birth of Jesus and the Easter. You know, we were CEOs back then, or I was. Christmas and Easter only. Right? So I knew about Jesus a little bit. I'd been in part of the church, but I never really experienced that love that the Bible talks about. But the day I did, I was able to accept Christ in the and that changed everything. I wouldn't be where I am today without that moment where I met Jesus and realized that Christ died for me. That I am forgiven. That I don't have to hold on to the baggage of my past and all my mistakes and failures. That when I'm feeling down and depressed, I'm never really alone because God is drawing closer to me than ever before. I know that for certain that he'll never forsake me and leave me alone. And throughout my life, here's the thing. I mean, it's like any relationship, right? You accept Jesus on that first day, but then as you begin to go through life and the curveballs happen and the unexpecteds and the trials and the tribulations, you begin to realize that God really loves you. That he's been there the whole time. That yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. And as my relationship with Christ and God has grown, I've realized even more the depths of God's love. But it's not just me. It's not just me. It's all of you. John 1, 4, uh, 9 through 10 says this. This is how God showed His love amongst us. He sent His one and only Son into the world. He gave. He gave His best. 
He sent His Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And He sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's the great news of Christmas, right? That God sent His Son to experience the life we experience. And to relate to us and to show us and teach us who God really is, His very nature. And if you know the Bible, then you know the Bible says God is love. It doesn't say God has love. It says He is love. It's in His very character, in His nature. It cannot be separated from who God is. God is love. And if God is love and He's willing to give His best and send His Son, then it proves that God, the Creator of the universe, the Creator of all things, loves us. As I said in the hinted about the children's sermon, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and at the end of creation, what does He create at the, the last day before He takes a rest? What does He create on the sixth day? Man, humanity, right? All of us. And how does he do it? I, I don't mean the technical stuff from chapter 2 about the dust. I mean, how does he do it? What does it say? Let us create in our, our own image. You have the imprint of God on you. He lives within you. You are a one of a kind created in the very image of God. That's how much He loves you. He created you to be like Him in His likeness. And He sent His Son. He sent His Son. You see, God wasn't just lonely. He didn't want, you know, a pet. He wanted a companion to love. You and I. God created us out of His love so that we might love God as He loves us. The good news is that He loves you on your best days and He loves you on your worst days. He loves you when you can feel His love so powerfully you can cut it with a knife and on those days when it seems like He's a hundred miles away. He loves you when you, when you feel like you don't even deserve that love. He loves you and there's nothing that you can do about it. That Carol Jackson always tells me. I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. Same as with God. God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing can stop God from loving you. I mean, you could try, but you can't do it. Because His love for you is based on His character and not anything that you do or you say. And that baby Jesus reminds us so powerfully of what God's willing to do to show His love. He came down from heaven and emptied Himself, taking on our form and living our life. And as He grew up into manhood, He showed us who God really is and the nature of His love and the extravagance of His love. And He gave and gave and gave out of love. And then... On the cross. It's almost as if when he was crucified and his arms were outstretched, he was telling all of us, I love you this much. I don't know about you. I don't know how deep your love for God is. I don't know if you believe God even loves you. But ask God to help your unbelief if you're struggling today. Ask Him to show His love for you in a powerful and beautiful way. Because God is the way to freedom through Jesus Christ. All the promises of the Scripture come true in your life and you're adopted into the family of God, but we all need Jesus. 
I didn't, de- I didn't just need Jesus the day I was sitting in Mark's office and said the sinner's prayer and accepted Jesus into my life. I didn't need Jesus just the, the, those bumps in the road when I got off the path that he set me on and I was in a lot of trouble. I don't need Jesus in those times when I don't know which way to turn. I need Jesus every day. And the reason I need Jesus every day is, despite what you may all think, I'm not perfect. I mean, I know it appears that way, but... What? Seriously, though, I know that I'm a sinner saved by grace. I know that I'm flawed and broken. I need healing. I know that I can't, I tried, believe me, I tried everything to do life on Tom's terms. It didn't work. The reason it didn't work is because at the very base of who I am, I'm a sinner. And I need God's grace and love in my life to cover sins that I commit. Give me the strength to ask for forgiveness then to receive forgiveness. God gave His one and only Son to set us free. I don't have to carry the burden of guilt and sin. You don't either. Not even death has a stronghold on the power of Jesus. We're free. Heirs to the kingdom. Adopted as sons and daughters. Children of God. We're chosen for a purpose and a plan. Jesus is our Savior, our Deliverer. He's everything. And without this gift of baby Jesus in a manger in Bethlehem so long ago, there is no hope. We're doomed to die in our sin. Created from God. And now, because of Jesus, we can approach the throne boldly. Covered in Jesus' righteousness. Covered in the love that Jesus has for each and every one of us. Sons and daughters of the living God. Well, if you don't know that love, you don't know about God's sacrificial giving and loving, I'd invite you to search your hearts. Maybe you've played church a lot, You've been there every Sunday. Every time the doors are open, you're here. She never really accepted Jesus. Maybe it's a a time in your life where life's just caught up to you. You thought you had it figured out, so you just kind of had Jesus on the sidelines. You just said, hey, Jesus, I got this. I'll call you if I need you. Maybe it's time to recommit your life. Follow Christ as your Savior. More importantly than your Savior, your Lord, rules in your heart. I don't know what your circumstances are today. I know one thing. Beyond it all, God wants to be in relationship with you. He already knows you better than you know yourself, but you're not going to surprise Him with anything. He wants you to accept the invitation to live for Him, to be transformed, to be more and more like Jesus. This Christmas, as we remember the birth of Jesus, have that opportunity. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the spirit of that first Christmas. Thank you for the love that you richly revealed to us through your words and the life, the actions of Jesus from his birth to the cross to the empty tomb. It's a love that we don't earn or deserve, but we thank you, Lord. Thank you for your grace that makes it possible. Till the day that we see you face to face to express our, situ- our appreciation, our worship and praises, know that 
you pray in heartfelt gratitude, deep and abiding joy because of your plan. Your plan to hold nothing back in Jesus Christ, Savior of the world. Amen. As we sing this Christmas carol, I invite you to stand, and the altar is open if you need to pray. Let's stand together as we sing. church or getting involved in something uh, for the sake of the gospel uh, is about a duty and a responsibility. God says I have to do it, so I'm going to do it, right? Whether I like it or not, I'm going to do it. But it's not about a duty or a responsibility as much as it's a response of love that we return to God. And there are always ways in which we respond to God's word, God's blessings, God's generosity in our lives. Today we have an opportunity to celebrate in response in our love for God by coming to his table. He's invited us to a feast. So how's that? I mean, you get the blessing for accepting the invitation and responding out of love. In the Jewish tradition of Passover, the people gathered around the table to share the Passover meal, ask a series of questions, and through those questions, it tells the story of God's miracle of freeing the Israelites, the Hebrew people, from bondage in Egypt. As we celebrate communion today, you're going to ask the questions just like that. And in the Jewish Passover tradition, the priest, or the head of the household, so to speak, would, the rabbi rather, the rabbi, or the head of the household, would respond and answer the questions, and that how, that's how the story is told. So as we respond out of love to God's words today, and His presence and blessings in our lives, that's the format for communion we use today. Passover format, where you ask the questions, and I respond to tell the story. So, with that said, 
All are invited. The young and the old, the rich and the poor, the lowest and the least. Sinners and saints together in communion. Come find your place here where there are no strangers or foreigners, only brothers and sisters in the sight of God. We give thanks because Jesus showed us the way. We give thanks because Jesus is the way. Jesus is a gift from God for the world. He was called Emmanuel, God with us. He came to save us from our sin. Jesus lived a life of thankfulness and gave his life as a sacrifice for many. We give thanks that he is our Savior, Christ the Lord. We eat because on the night before Jesus died, he ate with his friends. He gave them bread and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At the same time, at the same meal, he took a cup of wine and said, drink this. This is my blood of the covenant, the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin." We remember Jesus' birth and His presence as God with us. We remember Jesus' life and His love. We remember Jesus' suffering and death on the cross. We remember the resurrection and the promise of life. We remember that we are waiting in hope to see Jesus again. It's all right. Jesus accepts our messiness. Let us pray. God of grace, thank you for this bread and wine for the gift of Your Son, Jesus Christ. God of hope, fill us with Your Spirit today that we might have the wisdom to understand the mystery of this table. The depth and the height and the breadth and the length of Your love for us. Through this meal, strengthen us to be followers of Jesus. Community of peace and love in a broken world. Amen. Will my servers please come forward?
We have the gluten-free option on this side with Barry and Susan. If you wish to take the elements that way, come, Christ awaits.
Jesus, you truly are Emmanuel, God with us. In this season of hope, may this meal we've shared together nourish us to be your body in the world. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. With the angel of heaven, we join in singing your praises. Glory to God in the highest. Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. Let's stand together as we sing. Let's not just sing it, but let's do it. I won't uh, read through everything, but please take note. The office will be closed next week. Uh, we'll still have a bulletin, but there will not be a newsletter next week. So if you're wondering, no newsletter. Uh, but uh, as we go into tonight's service, let me uh, remind you, I hope that you'll return uh, for this evening's candlelight communion service. Now, you're probably thinking, well, why do I need communion again? Can you ever get enough of Jesus? There you go. And bring your family and friends. Invite somebody to come. It's a beautiful, beautiful service that we just said, right? Jesus is what? The, the only reason for the season. So let's draw our friends and family back to that only phrase, right? And show them our faith and devotion to God by inviting them and bringing them here. Yep, check the post office, keep up with your bulletin, and read your newsletter from last week, this week. So, hear this dismissal and blessing. Yep. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. I, I introduced you last week to Cameron as our substitute. He's going to volunteer to stand in the gap. Uh, while we continue to look for uh, someone, I have to start saying replace Nancy, cannot replace Nancy. No. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> it was easy when SPR met this week and interviewed Cameron, and he shared with us that God led him to come and help us. 
Amen. So it made it really easy for us to say, we want Cameron to be on the staff, to be an accompanist at not only the piano, but he also plays organ, and he sings in the choir. <laughs> We're getting a real deal, ladies and gentlemen. So Cameron, God bless you. Thank you. We appreciate you. Willing well, to come and help us. I just want to add real quickly, we are going to celebrate Nancy's retirement, but not right away. It'll be sometime after January the 1st, but we will do that because I know everybody wants to honor Nancy's 58 years of service to this church. Amen? So we will do that. She has agreed she didn't want to, but we put the pressure on her. We want to celebrate Nancy's contributions. So we'll see you tonight at and uh, hear these words of dismissal and blessing now. Be people of love. Be people of love. Be people of love. Let love live in your heart and share the love of Christ with all you meet. Share love by loving those you see regularly. Start by loving your community. Share love by loving those you do not know. How do your actions affect the rest of God's creation? Share love by praying for our world. In this Advent season, we need to see, feel, and share love. As you go out into the wonder of God's creation, share love, joy, peace, and hope with all those that you meet. Amen.